Welcome to City of Hope Online. Leave the Light On Christmas production is coming up on the 6th of December at the 8 and 9.30 a.m. services. Please like and share and help us spread this message. Thank you for remaining faithful with your financial contributions. May this message fill your heart with hope. Wow, what a year. Um, I'm really thankful for God for bringing me through this period of lockdown. Um, last year I've experienced a tick burnout and, and I just, was just in a very bad space emotionally. And with this a series that Pastor Jan um, have shared with us at church about relentless love and the embrace of the Father, I realized that the lockdown helped me to really process what was going on in my heart because I was so in a routine and so in this older brother mentality thing that I was so busy the whole time that I that I haven't realized really that 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 is what's going on within so this COVID helped me just to take a step back and to lean into the embrace of the father and to work through a, a few things and, and it was really a time of introspection and reflection and then also a time where my faith was stirred and built up especially financially and, and in a few other areas where I really had to put my faith into action. I also met, or not met, uh, I've been chatting to an awesome lady and um, uh, during this lockdown I just realized of what a support she's been to me and, and, and what support I could have been to her or how we supported each other and they just realized me that she might be the one. So God has been good and God has really brought out a lot of creativity and innovation within during this difficult time. Well, I want to greet each and every one of you this morning, especially of those of you who are coming online and you may be sitting in your lounges on this Sunday morning and uh, celebrating with us the very fact that Jesus Christ is alive, is risen and is among us. Isn't that beautiful? And for those of you in this house this morning, well, I would encourage you to really be expectant of what God wants to do in your life. Come on, who's expectant this morning? Now, I'm not saying that way, all right? Because some of you would have to look like Sarah's, yeah? But I, I'm saying be expectant of the things that God has in store for you. I think we sometimes miss out on the giftings that God has for us, the blessings that God has for us, because we don't come with expectation. So, kom ons wees verwachtend vanochtend, hey. And let's say, God, I know you've got something specially in store for me. Uh, who's enjoyed lockdown, by the way? I, I, you know what? I, I must be honest, I haven't enjoyed lockdown. But what I have really taken out of it, I've tried to take the good out of lockdown. And, uh, you know, I've, I've recognized my relationship with God has grown so much closer and stronger. And my faith has gone to another level. And for that, I'm truly grateful. And I've realized that the enemy, what the enemy has uh, designed for the church's destruction, I can see the church with committed people rising up and saying, listen, now is the time to show our faith. Now is the time to show the world that we're the light and the salt of this earth. Do you an amen to that? So you see, with lockdown, no matter how much we can say, well, it hasn't been pleasant and I wish it was over. And I, and I really do. I pray that it would come to a point where it's over. Um, but I think that's still going to be a good few weeks, a good few months before we can actually look back and say it's now something of the past. But you know what was amazing is that over the last few days, our staff did an exercise with Pastor Young and they were asked to list all the victorious things and all the good things that have happened during this period of almost nine months lockdown. And they came up with 85, now listen to this, 85 points which pointed to the victories that we've had in this church. And we see things like a borehole, you know, somebody donated money for a borehole, so we've almost been able to come off the grid when it comes to water for the church. We've seen things like the church, this very church that you belong to, coming online. 
On Sundays, people can watch our services. Uh, we see our children's church coming online. We see even our empowerment center where the word school is offered and where the counseling school is offered. Even there, Pastor Stephen has been able to take our Bible school and put it online. And we've got students that are registering with us right now. Isn't that ama amazing? Those are just some of the points of the 85 victories that we were able to record in a time of lockdown. But what was most amazing and very encouraging is that our online services grew from like 500 to 1,000, from 1,000 to 2,000, from 2,000 to 3,000. And do you know what? We broke the record a week ago and our viewing was more than 4,000 people. Now that's 4,000 views. If you took on average two people to a home, just two, let's be conservative, that gives us 8,000 people who were in church even though they were not present here with you. They were with us, 8,000 people that we would never have reached if it wasn't for being online. Now, I, I found it very encouraging because one of the congregation members came to to us, or not one of the congregation, one of the staff members came to me and said, wow, Pastor, you guys have really done well with this viewingship. And uh, thanks to Pastor Young and, uh, for, for making this possible, because without him and myself and really pushing this, we wouldn't have become, as this person put it, that influential. Now, I, I thought about that word, influential. Was I really, or was Pastor Young really influential be it on Facebook or YouTube? Or is this maybe a word that has been taken out of context and been used in, in the wrong way? Because you see, celebrities today are what we call influential. Am I right? If I had to say to you right now, how many of you are influential? How many will you, of you will raise your hands? You see, you're all hesitant. Why? Because we have this idea that the word influence belongs to celebrities and you know that's not so because we have defined influence incorrectly then because influence really is about my uh, encouragement or my influence or maybe over one or two people where I've seen their life change and uh, you see celebrities are looking for the numbers they're looking to influence people to follow them good or bad and our job, because Jesus says to you and to me, He says, we are actually the real influencers. We are the salt of the earth. Come on, Matthew chapter 5. And we are the light of the world. Now, I love that. Because that type, is, that type of influence is really what I want to seek out. I want to be an influential person when I know I'm making a difference, be it in Pastorina's life or Valme's life or... Um, Sunshine's life sitting up front here, but it's important that I know that I'm making a difference. Come on, just turn to somebody and say to that person this morning, you're kind of salty. Now, you see, because that's been influential. You, you become kind of salty. I, I, I forgot about this yesterday. I was going to send my wife down to the local butcher uh, who's in our congregation, Alvin, and I was going to say to him, have you got any bultong that doesn't have any salt in it? And then the, the, the answer sort of came from somewhere. You can't have bultong if it doesn't have salt on it. Am I right? Because the salt is what preserves the meat. Otherwise, I would be buying, and I love the South African term, and I need to use it even if you're watching online, that rock fraught. Okay, it becomes rotten. Okay, and this is so important. You see, we as a church and as people of God, we need to be salty. We need to preserve the values of the kingdom of God. We need to be influencing people in a godly way, offering them hope. Come on. And you know what? This series has been hearts after God. And I really believe that if we're going to be people, men and women after God, we need to be able to say to people, come on, you know, you're influential. You're making a difference. When lost, did somebody say to you, you're making a difference? Come on, a good difference in life. And that's what I believe God wants to hear from your life and from my life, is that we have influenced people. Now, put the definition of influence on the screen, and maybe they can just show that to you this morning. Then I want you to have a look at how the Collins Dictionary defines influence. Very interesting, because it really speaks about influencing people's hearts, 
It's about influencing them for the good. So this is not just a, cele a celebrity thing. It's something that's important for your, for your life and for my life. I often go back to the early beginning of my Christian walk, and I think there was a, a man by the name of Reverend Dennis Florence. He was a pastor up in Zanin, and I was in business in Zanin, and it was because of Dennis's influence over my life that I came to know Jesus. Because of one man's influence over my value system, over my belief system, he, he, he influenced me to such an extent that it wasn't just me leaving the business world, but it was becoming a pastor today where one man's influence now is over many others. Think about that. You may be leading one person to Jesus, but that one person may eventually be leading hundreds and thousands of people to Jesus. Come on, one man's influence over my life. And today we've got churches in Malawi, we've got this church, and I wonder to myself, how many people's lives have I touched with the love and the Word of God? Come on, do you see how important it is to be the salt of the earth? Now, I can take you into the Old Testament this morning, which I'd like to do, and I want to take you into the book of Kings, 1 Kings, and uh, chapter 13. It's a very interesting passage, a very powerful passage, because it speaks of influence. And in this context, it speaks of influence that went wrong, right? It speaks of ungodly influence. And a very, very important uh, passage for you to follow this morning. So I'm going to be reading 1 Kings 13, verses 1 to verse 2, and then verses 4 to verse 7, and then we'll dig in a little later. The Word of God says, And behold, a man of God... This is a prophet now. A man of God went from Judah to Bethel. Now, Bethel means house of God. So he was going to the place where worship was being conducted. And he went there by the word of the Lord, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. Now, Jeroboam was the king right, of Israel, and he was fulfilling a role that he should not have been fulfilling. That was the priest's job. And he has the king burning incense. So something's gone wrong already. Then the prophet cried out against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold a child, Josiah, by name shall be born to the house of David, and on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones shall be burnt. And so it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God who cried out against the altar in Bethel that he stretched out his hand from the altar saying, now watch this, he said, arrest him. And then his hand which he stretched out towards him, that is to the prophet, withered so that he could not pull it back to himself. Wow. Do you see a king, Jeroboam, had become a king that was blasphemous, a king that was adulterous, a king that was worshipping false gods. He was a king that was trying to fulfill the function right, of a priest, and he wasn't allowed to do that. But here he is, and he's standing, and he's doing the things that he shouldn't be doing. And it's said that he had influenced so many of the prophets and the priests of the day that the priests and the prophets had become corrupt. Can you imagine, eh? The very godly place that we all want to visit. Yes, Israel, God's chosen people, God's land. And what's happened? In this very land, we see corruption taking place. We see one man's influence over, over the house of God. In other words, the church. And it became a corrupt place. And this grieved God. And that's why God sends this prophet, this man of God, to Jeroboam. And he confronts Jeroboam publicly. And so we see Jeroboam reacting because now not only is he feeling humiliated, he's embarrassed by the truth that has been spoken, that he has become corrupt. And so the word continues and it says, The altar also was split apart and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Then the king answered and said to the man of God, Please entreat the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. Imagine, eh? everybody's watching this. His hand had withered up 
right? As he reached to grab hold of this prophet. And so the man of God entreated the Lord and the king's hand was restored to him and became as before. Now watch it. Isn't that miraculous? That, that, that's a miracle. You see, when God can restore something that already withered up, he gives back the man's hand in its complete state. Then the, kids, then the king said to the man of God, Come home with me and I will refresh yourself and I will give you a reward. Wow. Do you see what's coming out of this king's heart? I will give you a reward. In other words, I'll buy you over. Like I've bought over all the men of God and all the prophets of God. I've bought them over. I, they, they, they sold out to me. And now he wants to buy this man of God. He probably saw the miraculous power of God. And the prophet, the man of God, turns to King Jeroboam and says, Over my dead body are you going to buy me? Right? And he's very brave and he's very strong. He's not allowing this man to influence him, even by a reward. Now, come on, how many times haven't we seen in this very beloved country of South Africa, we've seen how people have been influenced, they've been bought over, they, they've paid the price because you can see now, even with the trials that are, are, that are happening in South Africa, corruption is coming to the fore. You see, and people will get what they deserve. Yeah, this king has the audacity not even to call upon his gods and say, listen, you sort him out. He, as he calls and says to the gods, arrest him, he grabs for this prophet, this priest. And of course, he suffers the consequences because he's touching not only God's anointed, but God's representation in that very moment. It's scary to see what can actually happen when you backslide in your faith. Okay? Jeroboam, Jeroboam has backslidden. And he has no respect even for the house of God anymore. That's sad. Eh? Can you imagine coming to the house of God and yeah, we sacrificing things to other gods instead of the true God. And so we continue reading. And as you read this passage, I'm just going to highlight the next few passages. But what's so important is that this young man, this prophet of God, he goes on his way because God had given him a command. And God's command was, I want you, after you've spoken to the king, you're to leave that territory and go back another way. I don't even want you to go back the same way. Now the word of God teaches in this passage that a prophet that had been bought over, an old man already, his sons, most probably also prophets by name only, they were attending this spiritual gathering, right? And they saw what had happened. And of course, they come home and they tell their dad, one of these corrupt prophets, listen, do you know what happened today in the house of God, in, in the place called Bethel? And his dad minister said, well, what happened? And so they begin to tell him how this prophet admonishes the king, corrects the king, rebukes the king. The king's hand withers up. Then God restores his hand. So, and all of a sudden, I'm sure this old man, this old prophet that had become so corrupt, must have thought to himself, wow, oh, how I long for those days when I used to walk in the ways of God. And so he says to his sons, I want this man to come to my house. And the Bible says, I'm going to read it to you in a moment. He saddles up his horse and he goes out to meet this young prophet who's now heading back to where he had come from. And he says to this young man, he lies. Because he knows this is the only way he's going to get this young man to his house. He says, an angel of the Lord visited me and told me about you and told, you, told me that you need to come to my house. And this young man is deceived. He's influenced now by a corrupt prophet. Listen to this. He said to him, I too am a prophet as you are. Now this is this, is this old corrupt prophet prophet speaking to the young man and an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying bring him back with you to your house that he may eat bread and drink water he was lying to him so he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water and he said well surely that wasn't too bad it actually was bad because remember in 1 Samuel chapter 15 we read last last Sunday in church that King Saul Two was told by the prophet Samuel, obedience is better than sacrifice. And yeah, this, this young boy 
that it defied this corrupt king which stood his man, it stood on the word, is now being influenced by this corrupt prophet. You know, God says, those of us who are in leadership will be judged more harshly than anyone else. Come on, you know, often people say, well, I want to be a pastor, I want to be this, I want to be... Hey, listen, you can by all means be a pastor, but remember, you're going to be judged more severely by God than anyone else. And this old man, he should have realized this. He deceived this young man. The young man goes and he feasts with this corrupt prophet. And then the story is really sad. Because when he leaves this corrupt prophet's home, a lion attacks him and kills him. He has a story. And when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard it, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient to the word of the Lord. Therefore the Lord has delivered him to the lion which has torn him and killed him according to the word of the Lord which he spoke to him. And he spoke to his son saying, Saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled it. Then he went and found his corpse thrown on the road. And the donkey and the lion standing by the corpse. The lion had not eaten the corpse nor torn the donkey. Interesting, eh? You see, let's obey the things of God. Otherwise, worse things come upon us. And the prophet took up the corpse of the man of God, laid it on the donkey, and brought it back. And so the old prophet came to the city to mourn and to bury him. Then he laid the corpse in his own tomb, and they mourned over him, saying, Alas, my brother. So it was, after he had buried him, that he spoke to his son, saying, when I am dead, then bury me in the tomb where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. Well, interesting passage. What can we learn from this? So much. You see, a man that should have been influencing others in a godly way, yeah, influences a man to his, the detriment of his destiny and his life. Come on, think about this. This is how badly this man had influenced this young man. Listen to it. And so it was after he had buried him that he spoke to his son saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the tomb where the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. Can I ask you a question? Are you allowing someone to bury you in their graves because of their bad influence? Are you allowing someone to bury you in their graves because of their bad influence that you succumb to? You see, yes, this old prophet, he's saying to his sons, it's my fault. I influenced this young man when he had a word of God to bring restoration to Israel, to bring hope again to Israel. I influenced him in such a way that he lost not only his life, he lost his destiny, he lost his purpose that God had given put upon his life. Can you imagine being short-lived like that? I'm thinking to God, you know what? I don't want to, I don't want to short-live. My, I don't want to short-circuit my life. And so I pray. I pray that even as I stand before you, that I'll say, God, I want to align myself with your word. I want to speak your word. And you see, when you and I leave this place, we should be kind of salty. Hey? We should be a kind of light, man. We should be the guys giving hope outside there. And influencing society to pick up the values and the norms of, of the kingdom of God. Don't you agree? You see, yeah, we today, you know, as much as that young man was living in lion country, if I can call it that, we living in lion country. Why do I say that? Because 1 Peter chapter 5 speaks of Satan who prowls like a lion, waiting to devour us, waiting to short circuit our life, waiting to take us out. That's Satan's job. And, and that's why I'm saying, even now in South Africa, we're living in lion country where there are so many corrupt officials. There are devious, even pastors. I look at recently what happened with a pastor that fled this country. Corruption. Order of the day. And I'm thinking, how many people were influenced under that ministry for a pastor that, that should be looked up to? And I'm thinking, God, help me to be a better pastor because I'm just as human. Isn't that scary? You know, because sometimes we want to judge others, but then we realize, but I'm just as human. 
And that can happen to me if I don't stay in an alignment with God's Word and, and, God, and being led by His Spirit. And that's why it's so important to realize today that even though Satan masquerades as a lion seeking whom to devour, we will be guided correctly if we follow the Word of the Lord. And can, Come on, Psalm 119 speaks so beautifully in Psalm, 100, uh, Psalm 119 verse 105. It says, the Word is a lamp unto my feet. You see, if we're going to navigate our way through this beautiful country, even though it's lying territory at the moment, then we need the Word of God. And I love it when in the book of Romans it says, the sons of God and the daughters of God are, are led by the Spirit. We're not led by flesh. And you see, this young man fell. His destiny was shaken because he chose to be led by the voice of someone else and not the voice of God. And I want to say to you, come on, let's, let's turn our churches back to where they should be. You know, when Jesus turned the, the, temp, the, the tables upside down in the temple, I think he was doing the right thing. He was turning them up to be where they should be, upside down, because it wasn't a place for bartering and for selling merchandise. So we need to get the temple right again. We need to come in hopeful and we need to leave hopeful and not helpless. Am I right, church? That's what God is looking for. So can I ask you that question again? He has a prophet who destroyed another man's life. Who wants to bury you in their graves? You see, this young prophet was buried eventually in a false prophet's grave. Now I'm asking you this morning, who's influencing you in life? Who's influencing me in life? What's influencing us? In this world of ours. Can I maybe put another way? What entertains you? You see, maybe, maybe you've been influenced by social media. Or maybe you've been influenced by the movies that you look at. Or sometimes the books that we read. Come on, something could be influencing you. And the only way we know what's influencing us, if we ask the question... Does whatever I'm looking at or reading or music that I'm listening to, is it building my faith? If it's not building my faith, then it must be influencing me. Come on. Are you with me this morning? You see, the world has an influence. Culture has an influence over us. And God wants to have an influence over us. God is saying, I want to influence you so that you can influence others. But we are submitting ourselves all the time to different things of this world. And sometimes we don't even realize it. Or, or maybe I can put this question to you. What, what do you do with your money? If you've got an increase or a bonus, or maybe you've got the, the jackpot, the lotto, whatever it may be. What do you do with it? Who influences you? What influences you? You know, I, I know some people who've got a, an increase. They, the first thing they do is that we're going to go out and we're going to party. And we go for dinner. And they celebrate. And then I look at my younger son, and I really want to isolate him in the story here this morning. Because Jared has been so blessed by God. Even during this lockdown, because you know what? When, when Jared gets something, be it whatever money he makes, the first fruits of that will go to God. He won't even take his wife out to celebrate. He'll say to her, listen, this is our first fruits. I, I want to honor God and what He's done for me. And I love my boy for that. I, I, I say to Desiree often, I say, that's the little bit of salt that we've been able to, to influence him with. That, that's the word of God and it's his faith. And the, the next thing, I mean, just recently he got this huge contract. Yeah, in lockdown. It's, it's unheard of. And the first thing he does, he says, how can, I, how can I bless, how can I honor my God? And, and really, you know, I think about that and I wish, I, when I was that age, I could have been honoring God like that. And then people look at him and say, you, you are so lucky. No, he's not lucky. He's favored. And he's blessed. And he knows what influence he's under. And it's that godly influence that he's under. And that's what encourages me. I say to Desiree, am I doing enough for God? Where do my priorities lie in life? Maybe, maybe let me give you another question. Have you ever thought about your self-worth? You see, if you want to 
understand who's influencing you, how do you feel about yourself? Do you, would you say this morning that you're under the influence of God? Or would you say you're under the influence of culture? And when I say oh, you're under the influence of culture, it would mean, well, is it important to you what labels you wear? How you look? Well, that, that could be pretty important, the way you look. But the labels that we wear sometimes give people self-worth. You know, if they're not wearing the right shoes, if they're not wearing the right trainers, then they, they've got no self-worth. And I say to you this morning, if you can get up every day and realize that you are a masterpiece of God's, Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, you are created to be His workmanship, His masterpiece. We shouldn't have a problem with self-worth. You see, it depends on what influence we find ourselves under that causes so many people to lose their self-worth. And I want you to think about what I'm saying this morning. Because God is saying, under what influence do you find yourself? Now, have you ever, let me illustrate what influence you've been under. Because sometimes we don't realize we've been under the influence. How many of you have ever been with a drunk person? Let me, let me see. Okay, you see, I try to word that pretty pretty gently this morning. How many of you have been around a drunk person? I didn't ask you how many of you have been drunk. All right. If I had to speak from my BC days, I'd probably be able to give you a good illustration this morning. But come on, people who are under the influence of alcohol, right, really don't always know who they are. Am I right? Or, or maybe because the more alcohol they drink, they think they know who they are. And I've noticed that when a person becomes drunker by the minute, right, they begin to see things, speak things differently to what they were doing prior to them being drunk. Have you noticed that in life? They even begin to see themselves becoming attractive. Or after a couple of drinks, you know, four or five drinks, they begin to see other people even more attractive than what they are. And they start complimenting people. I've heard this. I don't know about you. Maybe, you know, I'm preaching to the saved, yeah, but I've seen this happen. And you get one dude sitting next to another dude and one brother saying to another brother, I really love you. you you're my best friend. Have you ever heard that in conversation when people have been drunk? They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're saying. They don't even realize that they're under the influence. You see, and that's what happens to us. Sometimes we need to take or do a bit of introspection to realize what influence are we under? Are we under the world's influence, cultural influence, or are we under God's influence? You see, and that's pretty important that you and I begin to realize that. So important. Because we can do stupid things and say stupid things and behave stupidly if we don't realize what influence we're under. Some of us may realize this morning we drifted a little from God when we realize that we've been under the influence of culture. You see, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 to verse 8 says the following. I'll hear this. If we've got it on the screen, it says the following. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So you see, watch that word. It says, humble yourselves. In other words, submit unto God's influence. Come under God's influence because he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You see, and that's happening in our world today and in this beautiful country it's it's obvious that satan is taking out a lot of beautiful people because they're not walking in alignment with god's plans they're not walking soberly under god's plans so so important you see we're living in a social cu culture that is hostile towards god can i can i say that again we're living in a social culture that is hostile to God. If you look at everything happening in the world right now, it seems as if we Christians are inferior to the world. I want to say to you, we the head and we're not the tail. 
God is going to build His kingdom through you and through me as we submit to Him and to His influence. So my question is to you this morning, how are we going to submit to God's influence? Well, there's one book that really stands out for me in the Bible. And that's that story of Daniel and the Hebrew boys that were brought back from Babylon, uh, brought back from Israel to Babylon. Listen, they were brought into a social culture that resisted God's influence. It resisted God's word. A social culture, right, that should have been detriment to their destiny. Yeah, these young boys, probably of royal blood, young boys, the Bible says intelligent, very good looking. These were the boikies of the moment. Eh? And King Nebuchadnezzar sees in these Hebrew boys such, such great value. And he wants to use his influence over them to raise them up to be administrators, governors in his kingdom. Now what I love about this, they force these boys to learn the language of the day. They force these boys to learn the culture of the day. They force these boys to dress like them. They label them with the right dress. They force these boys to even have their names changed. Come, can you imagine? I wonder how many of us would have coped under that type of influence. If you think about it, Daniel's name, who, who was, who was uh, later changed to Belteshazzar. And then you think of Shadrach's name, that was, or, or rather, um, what's his name? Azariah, that was changed to Abendigo. Or Haniah, whose name was changed to Shadrach. Or Mishal, whose name was changed to Meshach. These were Hebrew boys. They were youngsters. They were teenagers. Strong. Intelligent. How did they withstand the influence of that culture in that day? That's often I've thought about it. Well, Daniel himself said, I will do everything else they ask me to do. But I will not. I will not eat of the food that they've consecrated to their gods. And so he goes to his overseer and he says to his overseer, everything else, you can label me, you can give me a new name, you can give me new clothes, you can give me a new language, you can in, uh, uh, um, in, in bring me into a new culture. But he says, I cannot eat your food. And I guarantee you I'm still going to look good. And that's where this whole Daniel fast comes from. The 21-day fast that we, we practice almost every year. Daniel says, I'm not eating that food. And you watch. I'm going to still look good. I'm going to still stay strong. I'm going to stay sane. I'm going to be intelligent for your administrative tasks. And his overseer says to him, you can do it. But the word behind this is what fascinates me. In Daniel chapter 1 verse 8, how did he get himself to submit and to stay submitted to God's influence. The Word of God says the following, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now watch it, the chief of the eunuchs. Do you realize that even his future was taken away? He would never be a father. But he purposed himself. Come on, there's another word for that. He resolved. How many times haven't you at the beginning of a new year say, I'm going to make a new year's resolution? Well, here's a resolution. David is saying, I, uh, uh, Daniel is saying, I am resolving to purpose in my heart. I will not eat of that food and I will submit to the Lord my God. Come on. You see, that's the only way we are going to continue to influence people if we purpose ourselves to the purposes of God. When we align ourselves to His values, to His norms in this kingdom, and we say, from today, I resolve to live a life worthy of the calling that God has got on my life. Remember, that's what Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4. He says, as a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling. Now, come on, I, I love this part. I love it. I purpose myself. How am I going to purpose myself? Well, maybe each day or each week rather, purpose yourself to do something different. 
purpose yourself. You say, well, from today, when I open my eyes, I'm not going to pick up my cell phone to see what social media has to say or how many likes I've got or to see, you know, what's happening. I'm going to pick up the Word of God. Come on, you've got to learn to purpose yourself. You've got to learn to resolve in your own heart. Well, this is what I'm going to do. And it's going to take discipline. Like it took discipline. Can you imagine with Daniel and they brought the crayfish in and the prawns in and Daniel said, no, I can't do that yet. I mean, they brought the, the boltong in and Daniel said, no, I'm not going to eat that. Come on, guys. He purposed in his heart. So you see, if we can purpose in our heart, we can, one, remain under the influence of God so that we in turn can be the salt of the earth and the light of this world. You see, maybe another idea is, what about saying to yourself, well, financially, every time I get blessed, I'm going to bring, bring my first fruits to the Lord. I'm going, to, I'm going to resolve in my heart to honor God. You see, that's one way I can test, am I under the influence of God or Am I under the influence of the world? Or maybe if you're young and single, yeah, and you're thinking of marriage and there's this date that you've got, you've got to learn to resolve in your heart. I'm not going to have sex before marriage. I'm going to keep myself pure. I'm going to resolve in my heart to stay pure for my partner one day. Come on, amen. You see, that's about making this resolution. And Daniel made it and he stuck to it. He said, I'm going to stick to this thing. You can change my labels. You can change my name. You can change everything else. But I resolve in my heart not to eat of anything that has been set aside for false gods. Come on, do, do I hear somebody saying amen here this morning? Hey? Amen. Maybe you need to resolve this morning that when you get up in the mornings, you're going to pray with your wife or you're going to pray with your children. But you're going to resolve to do things a little different. You see, and then the world will have no hold over your life and my life. Hear me again. We are living in a society that is hostile to God. It's hostile to God's kingdom. It's hostile to you and to me. Let the Holy Spirit and this is my prayer, that you allow the Holy Spirit to guide you before someone else influences you in an ungodly and devious way. Let God's Spirit, let His Word be your lamp unto your feet, that no matter what the lion country looks like, you'll walk safely through it. Allow God to impart His Word for your destination. So can you say this with me this morning? I'm going to purpose myself to come under the influence of God. I resolve today that I will live a life as God intended, according to His kingdom values and norms. Now you know what Joshua said in Joshua 24 verse 15? As for me, and my family, we shall serve the Lord. Can we make that the general resolution in this church today? If you're sitting in your home, you're sitting in your lounge this morning, that you would say with us, can you say this with me? It's on the screen. As for me and my family, we shall serve the Lord.
the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Yeah. All my life you have been faithful. We trust this message filled your heart with hope. Once again, we appreciate your financial contribution. Kindly help us spread hope by sharing this service. 